Leviathan, were the matter, for me and power of a commonwealth, ecclesiastical and civil. Book by Thomas Hobbes. Narrated by Andrew. Originally published in 1651. This is a great audiobook production, created for research, study, and discussion purposes. Chapter 21. Of the Liberty of Subjects. Liberty what? Liberty, or freedom, signifieth properly the absence of opposition. By opposition, I mean external impediments of motion. It may be applied no less to irrational and inanimate creatures than to rational. For whatsoever is so tied or environed as it cannot move, but within a certain space, which space is determined by the opposition of some external body, we say it hath not liberty to go further. And so of all living creatures, whilst they are imprisoned or restrained with walls or chains, and of the water whilst it is kept in by banks or vessels, that otherwise would spread itself into a larger space, we used to say, they are not at liberty, to move in such manner. As without those external impediments they would. But when the impediment of motion is in the constitution of the thing itself, we use not to say, it wants the liberty, but the power to move. As when a stone lieth still, or a man is fast ned to his bed by sickness. What it is to be free. And according to this proper, and generally received meaning of the word, a free man, is he, that in those things, which by his strength and wit he is able to do, is not hind read to do what he has a will to. But when the words free and liberty are applied to anything but bodies, they are abused. For that which is not subject to motion is not subject to impediment. And therefore, when to said, for example, the way is free, no liberty of the way is signified, but of those that walk in it without stop. And when we say a gift is free, there is not meant any liberty of the gift, but of the giver, that was not bound by any law or covenant to give it. So when we speak freely, it is not the liberty of voice or pronunciation, but of the man, who no law hath obliged to speak otherwise than he did. Lastly, from the use of the word free will, no liberty can be inferred to the will, desire, or inclination, but the liberty of the man. Which consisteth in this, that he finds no stop in doing what he has the will, desire, or inclination to do. Fear and liberty consistent. Fear and liberty are consistent. As when a man throweth his goods into the sea for fear the ship should sink, he doth it nevertheless very willingly, and may refuse to do it if he will. It is therefore the action of one that was free. So a man sometimes pays his debt only for fear of imprisonment, which because no body hind dread him from detaining, was the action of a man at liberty. And generally all actions which men do in commonwealths, for fear of the law or actions, which the doers had liberty to omit. Liberty and necessity consistent. Liberty and necessity are consistent, as in the water, that hath not only liberty, but a necessity of descending by the channel, so likewise in the actions which men voluntarily do. Which, because they proceed from their will, proceed from liberty. And yet because every act of man's will, and every desire, and inclination proceedeth from some cause. Which causes in a continual shin, whose first link in the hand of God the first of all causes, proceed from necessity. So that to him that could see the connection of those causes, the necessity of all men's voluntary actions, would appear manifest. And therefore God, that seeth, and disposeth all things, seeth also that the liberty of man in doing what he will, is accompanied with the necessity of doing that which God will, and no more. Nor less. For though men may do many things, which God does not command, nor is therefore author of them, yet they can have no passion, nor appetite to any thing, of which appetite God's will is not the cause. And did not his will assure the necessity of man's will, and consequently of all that on man's will dependeth, the liberty of men would be a contradiction, an impediment to the omnipotence and liberty of God. And this shall suffice, as to the matter in hand, of that natural liberty, which only is properly called liberty artificial bonds, or covenants. But as men, for the attaining of peace and conservation of themselves thereby, have made an artificial man, which we call a commonwealth. So also have they made artificial chains, called civil laws, which they themselves, by mutual covenants, have fastened at one end, to the lips of that man, or assembly. To whom they have given the sovereign power, and at the other end to their own ears. These bonds in their own nature but weak, may nevertheless be made to hold, by the danger, 
though not by the difficulty of breaking them. Liberty of subjects consisteth in liberty from covenants. In relation to these bonds only it is, that I am to speak now, of the liberty of subjects. For seeing there is no commonwealth in the world, for the regulating of all the actions and words of men, as being a thing impossible. It followeth necessarily, that in all kinds of actions, by the laws predetermined, men have the liberty of doing what their own reasons shall suggest, for the most profitable to themselves. For if we take liberty in the proper sense, for corporal liberty. That is to say, freedom from chains and prison, it were very absurd for men to clamor as they do, for the liberty they so manifestly enjoy. Again, if we take liberty, for an exemption from laws, it is no less absurd, for men to demand as they do, that liberty, by which all other men may be masters of their lives. And yet as absurd as it is, this is it they demand. Not knowing that the laws are of no power to protect them, without a sword in the hands of a man, or men, to cause those laws to be put in execution. The liberty of a subject lieth therefore only in those things, which in regulating their actions, the sovereign hath predetermined, Such as is the liberty to buy, and sell, and otherwise contract with one another. To choose their own abode, their own diet, their own trade of life, and institute their children as they themselves think fit, and the like. Liberty of the subject consistent with unlimited power of the sovereign. Nevertheless we are not to understand that by such liberty, the sovereign power of life and death is either abolished or limited. For it has been already shown that nothing the sovereign representative can do to a subject, on what pretense soever, can properly be called injustice or injury. Because every subject is author of every act the sovereign doth. So that he never wanteth right to anything, otherwise, than as he himself is the subject of God, and bound thereby to observe the laws of nature. And therefore it may, and doth often happen in commonwealths, that a subject may be put to death, by the command of the sovereign power. And yet neither do the other wrong, as when Jephthah caused his daughter to be sacrificed. In which, in the like cases, he that so dieth, had liberty to do the action, for which he is nevertheless, without injury put to death. And the same holdeth also in a sovereign prince, that putteth to death an innocent subject. For though the action be against the law of nature, as being contrary to equity, as was the killing of Uriah, by David Winky Face, yet it was not an injury to Uriah, but to God. Not to Uriah, because the right to do what he pleased, was given him by Uriah himself, and yet to God, because David was God's subject, and prohibited all iniquity by the law of nature. Which distinction, David himself, when he repented the fact, evidently confirmed, saying, To thee only have I sinned. In the same manner, the people of Athens, when they banished the most potent of their commonwealth for ten years, thought they committed no injustice, and yet they never questioned what crime he had done. But what hurt he would do, nay they commanded the banishment of they knew not whom. And every citizen bringing his oyster shell into the marketplace, written with the name of him he desired should be banished, without actual accusing him, sometimes banished in Aristides. For his reputation of justice, and sometimes a scurrilous jester, as hyperbolous, to make a jest of it. And yet a man cannot say, the sovereign people of Athens wanted right to banish them, or an Athenian the liberty to jest, or to be just. The liberty which writers praise, is the liberty of sovereigns, not of private men. The liberty, whereof there is so frequent, and honorable mention, in the histories, and philosophy of the Antient Greeks, and Romans, and in the writings. And discourse of those that from them have received all their learning in the politics is not the liberty of particular men. But the liberty of the commonwealth, which is the same with that, which every man then should have, if there were no civil laws, nor commonwealth at all. And the effects of it also be the same. For as amongst masterless men, there is perpetual war, of every man against his neighbor, no inheritance, to transmit to the son, nor to expect from the father, no propriety of goods or lands. No security, but a full and absolute liberty in every particular man. So in states, and commonwealths not dependent on one another, every commonwealth, not every man, has an absolute liberty to do what it shall judge, that is to say, what that man, or assembly that representeth it, shall judge, most conducing to their benefit. But with all, they live in the condition of a perpetual war, and upon the confines of Battelle, with their frontiers armed, and cannons planted against their neighbors roundabout. 
The Athenians and Romanes were free, that is, free commonwealths, not that any particular men had the liberty to resist their own representative, but that their representative had the liberty to resist or invade other people. There is written on the turrets of the city of Lucca in great characters at this day, the word libertus. Yet no man can thence infer that a particular man has more liberty or immunity from the service of the commonwealth there than in Constantinople. Whether a commonwealth be monarchical or popular, the freedom is still the same. But it is an easy thing for men to be deceived by the specious name of liberty. And for want of judgment to distinguish, mistake that for their private inheritance and birthright, which is the right of the public only. And when the same error is confirmed by the authority of men in reputation for their writings in this subject, it is no wonder if it produce sedition and change of government. In these western parts of the world, we are made to receive our opinions concerning the institution and rights of commonwealths from Aristotle, Cicero, and other men, Greeks and Romanes. That living under popular states derive those rights not from the principles of nature, but transcribe them into their books out of the practice of their own commonwealths, which were popular. As the grammarians describe the rules of language out of the practice of the time, or the rules of poetry out of the poems of Homer and Virgil. And because the Athenians were taught to keep them from desire of changing their government, that they were freemen, and all that lived under monarchy were slaves. Therefore, Aristotle puts it down in his politics, lib 6.cap.2, in democracy, liberty is to be supposed, for it is commonly held that no man is free in any other government, and is Aristotle. So Cicero and other writers have grounded their civil doctrine on the opinions of the Romans, who were taught to hate monarchy at first by them that having deposed their sovereign, shared amongst them the sovereignty of Rome, and afterwards by their successors. And by reading of these Greek and Latine authors, men from their childhood have gotten a habit, under a false shoe of liberty, of favoring tumults, and of licentious controlling the actions of their sovereigns, and again of controlling those controllers with the effusion of so much blood. As I think I may truly say, there was never anything so dearly bought as these western parts have bought the learning of the Greek and Latine tongues. Liberty of the subject, how to be measured. To come now to the particulars of the true liberty of a subject, that is to say, what are the things, which though commanded by the sovereign, he may nevertheless, without injustice, refuse to do. We are to consider what rights we pass say away when we make a commonwealth. Or, which is all one, what liberty we deny ourselves by owning all the actions without exception of the man or assembly we make our sovereign. For in the act of our submission consisteth both our obligation and our liberty, which must therefore be inferred by arguments taken from thence. There being no obligation on any man, which Ari saith not from some act of his own, for all men equally are by nature free. And because such arguments must either be drawn from the express words, I authorize all his actions, or from the intention of him that submitteth himself to his power. Which intention is to be understood by the end for which he so submitteth winky face. The obligation and liberty of the subject is to be derived either from those words or others equivalent. Or else from the end of the institution of sovereignty, namely, the peace of the subjects within themselves and their defense against a common enemy. Subjects have liberty to defend their own bodies, even against them that lawfully invade them. First, therefore, seeing sovereignty by institution is by covenant of every one to every one, and sovereignty by acquisition, by covenants of the vanquished to the victor or child to the parent. It is manifest that every subject has liberty in all those things, the right whereof cannot by covenant be transferred. I have shown before in the 14th chapter that covenants not to defend a man's own body are void. Therefore, are not bound to hurt themselves. If the sovereign command a man, though justly condemned, to kill, wound, or maim himself, or not to resist those that assault him, or to abstain from the use of food, air, medicine, or any other thing, without which he cannot live, yet hath that man the liberty to disobey. If a man be interrogated by the sovereign, or his authority, concerning a crime done by himself, he is not bound, without assurance of pardon, to confess it. Because no man, as I have shown in the same chapter, can be obliged by covenant to accuse himself. Again, 
The consent of a subject to sovereign power is contained in these words, I authorize, or take upon me, all his actions, in which there is no restriction at all of his own former natural liberty, for by allowing him to kill me, I am not bound to kill myself when he commands me. Tis one thing to say, kill me, or my fellow, if you please, another thing to say, I will kill myself, or my fellow. It followeth therefore, that no man is bound by the words themselves, either to kill himself, or any other man. And consequently, that the obligation a man may sometimes have, upon the command of the sovereign to execute any dangerous or dishonorable office, dependeth not on the words of our submission, but on the intention which is to be understood by the end thereof. When therefore our refusal to obey frustrates the end for which the sovereignty was ordained, then there is no liberty to refuse, otherwise there is. Nor to warfare, unless they voluntarily undertake it. Upon this ground, a man that is commanded as a soldier to fight against the enemy, though his sovereign have right enough to punish his refusal with death, may nevertheless in many cases refuse. Without injustice, as when he substitute the sufficient soldier in his place, for in this case he deserteth not the service of the commonwealth. And there is allowance to be made for natural timorousness, not only to women, of whom no such dangerous duty is expected, but also to men of feminine courage. When armies fight, there is on one side, or both, a running away. Yet when they do it not out of treachery, but fear, they are not esteemed to do it unjustly, but dishonorably. For the same reason, to avoid Batel is not injustice, but cowardice. But he that enrolleth himself a soldier, or taketh impressed money, taketh away the excuse of a timorous nature, and is obliged not only to go to the Batel, but also not to run from it, without his captain's leave. And when the defense of the commonwealth requireth at once the help of all that are able to bear arms, every one is obliged. Because otherwise the institution of the commonwealth, which they have not the purpose or courage to preserve, was in vain. To resist the sword of the commonwealth in defense of another man, guilty or innocent, no man hath liberty, because such liberty takes away from the sovereign the means of protecting us, and is therefore destructive of the very essence of government. But in case a great many men together have already resisted the sovereign power unjustly or committed some capital crime, for which every one of them expecteth death, whether have they not the liberty then to join together and assist and defend one another? Certainly they have, for they but defend their lives, which the guilty man may as well do as the innocent. There was indeed injustice in the first breach of their duty, their bearing of arms subsequent to it, though it be to maintain what they have done, is no new unjust act. And if it be only to defend their persons, it is not unjust at all. But the offer of pardon taketh from them, to whom it is offered, the plea of self-defense, and mocketh their perseverance in assisting, or defending the rest, unlawful. The greatest liberty of subjects dependeth on the silence of the law. As for other liberties, they depend on the silence of the law. In cases where the sovereign has prescribed no rule, there the subject hath the liberty to do, or forbear, according to his own discretion. And therefore such liberty is in some places more, and in some less, and in some times more, and other times less, according as they that have the sovereignty shall think most convenient. As for example, there was a time, when in England a man might enter into his own land, and dispossess such as wrongfully possessed it, by force. But in after times, that liberty of forcible entry was taken away by a statute made, by the king in parliament. And in some places of the world, Men have the liberty of many wives, in other places, such liberty is not allowed. If a subject have a controversy with his sovereign, of debt, or of right of possession of lands or goods, or concerning any service required at his hands, or concerning any penalty corporal, or pecuniary, grounded on a precedent law, he hath the same liberty to sue for his right, as if it were against a subject, and before such judges, as are appointed by the sovereign. For seeing the sovereign demandeth by force of a former law, and not by virtue of his power, he declareth thereby, that he requireth no more, than shall appear to be due by that law. The soot therefore is not contrary to the will of the sovereign, and consequently the subject hath the liberty to demand the hearing of his cause, and sentence, according to that law. But if he demand, or take anything by pretense of his power, there lieth, in that case, no action of law. For all that is done by him in virtue of his power is done by the authority of every subject, and consequently, 
He that brings an action against the sovereign, brings it against himself. If a monarch or sovereign assembly grant a liberty to all or any of his subjects, which grant standing, he is disabled to provide for their safety, the grant is void. Unless he directly renounce or transfer the sovereignty to another. For in that he might openly, if it had been his will, and in plain terms, have renounced or transferred it, and did not, it is to be understood it was not his will. But that the grant proceeded from ignorance of the repugnancy between such a liberty and the sovereign power, and therefore the sovereignty is still retained. And consequently all those powers, which are necessary to the exercising thereof. Such as are the power of war, and peace, of judicature, of appointing officers, and counselors, of levying money, and the rest named in the eighteenth chapter. In what cases subjects absolved of their obedience to their sovereign? The obligation of subjects to the sovereign is understood to last as long, and no longer, than the power lasteth, by which he is able to protect them. For the right men have by nature to protect themselves, when none else can protect them, can by no covenant be relinquished. The sovereignty is the soul of the commonwealth, which once departed from the body, the members don't no more receive their motion from it. The end of obedience is protection, which, wheresoever a man seeth it, either in his own, or in another sword, nature applieth his obedience to it, and his endeavor to maintain it. And though sovereignty, and the intention of them that make it, be immortal, it is it in its own nature, not only subject to violent death, by foreign war, but also through the ignorance, and passions of men, it hath in it, from the very institution, many seeds of a natural mortality, by intestine discord. In case of captivity, if a subject be taken prisoner in war, or his person, or his means of life be within the guards of the enemy, and hath his life and corporal liberty given him, on condition to be subject to the victor. He hath liberty to accept the condition, and having accepted it, is the subject of him that took him, because he had no other way to preserve himself. The case is the same, if he be detained on the same terms, in a foreign country. But if a man be held in prison, or bonds, or is not trusted with the liberty of his body, he cannot be understood to be bound by covenant to subjection. And therefore may, if he can, make his escape by any means whatsoever. In case the sovereign cast off the government from himself and heirs. If a monarch shall relinquish the sovereignty, both for himself and his heirs, his subjects return to the absolute liberty of nature. Because, though nature may declare who are his sons, and who are the nearest of his kin, yet it dependeth on his own will, as hath been said in the precedent chapter, who shall be his heir. If therefore he will have no heir, there is no sovereignty, nor subjection. The case is the same, if he die without known kindred, and without declaration of his heir. For then there can no heir be known, and consequently no subjection be due. In case of banishment. If the sovereign banishes subject, during the banishment, he is not subject. But he that is sent on a message, or hath leave to travel, is still subject. But it is, by contract between sovereigns, not by virtue of the covenant of subjection. For whosoever entreth into another's dominion, is subject to all the laws thereof, unless he have a privilege by the amity of the sovereigns, or by special license. In case the sovereign render himself subject to another. If a monarch subdued by war, render himself subject to the victor, his subjects are delivered from their former obligation, and become obliged to the victor. But if he be held prisoner, or have not the liberty of his own body, he is not understood to have given away the right of sovereignty. And therefore his subjects are obliged to yield obedience to the magistrates formerly placed, governing not in their own name, but in his. For, his right remaining, the question is only of the administration, that is to say, of the magistrates and officers. Which, if he have not means to name, he is supposed to approve those, which he himself had formerly appointed. For more audiobook like this, hit the subscribe button and click on the notification bell so you get notified when we post a new audiobook. Thanks for listening.